Hello, everyone, and welcome to For the Love of Animals, a presentation of Pinellas County Animal Services and Inspiration, 1110 AM. I'm your host, Len Szynski, from the Pinellas County Communications Department. For the Love of Animals is a celebration of our connection and commitment to all things animal-related in the Tampa Bay area. And during the next hour, we'll be sharing with you information about the animals we love and the services and programs provided by Pinellas County Animal Services. First up, right out of the gate this hurricane season, Tropical Storm Andrea was a surprise storm for residents of Pinellas County, and it created some heartaches for the Humane Society of Pinellas. With me today to share that story is the Executive Director of the Humane Society of Pinellas, Sarah Brown. Sarah, welcome Thank to our program. Thank you so much. Thank so, you. So nice to have you here today. Thank you. Well, first of all, you know, um, Pinellas County Animal Services is the government-run organization that tries to provide for cats and dogs in Pinellas County, but there are so many cats and dogs so many animal lovers that it's impossible for any one organization to do the job alone and organizations like the Humane Society are so important as partners to us with what we're trying to accomplish here and we thank you for being committed to that role as a, as a community partner well we're certainly committed to it and we're excited to be able to help Pinellas County in general and animal services they are a great partner to us and we have great collaborative efforts and we, we want to be there for the animals in our community so we want to be there to support them as much as we possibly can well you guys do a fantastic job and and once again our, our hearts and our, our hats are off to you uh, but you've got some uh, exciting programs of your own going on this summer so tell me about uh, pick me pride the pick me project this summer. Well, the Humane Society of Pinellas was one of 50 shelters competing for $100,000. It is a contest through Rachel Ray and the ASPCA National Organization. And we are all competing to adopt out as many animals as possible into great homes from June 1st through the end of August. Our goal is to adopt out 999 animals in 90 days. So we're, we're a couple weeks into it. We've already surpassed our June numbers from last year. So we're excited. We've adopted out more than 170 animals in the first couple weeks of June. And so we're, we're kind of ahead of schedule. I don't want to jinx it at all, but right now we're, we're looking good, and we're just going to charge forward and keep adopting out as many animals as possible. It's so amazing finding new homes for all those animals, and what a way for somebody to spend the summer with yeah. a new dog or cat. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, now, the summer didn't start out so well for you. It was a little shaky. Yes. Uh, tell me what happened on June 6th. Well, unfortunately... Um, Tropical Storm Andrea decided to wreak a little havoc on our shelter um, in the morning of June, uh, June 6th. Our roof decided it didn't want to withstand anymore. Mother Nature decided she wanted to play a bad joke on us and collapsed our roof. Unfortunately, it is in our adoption area where we were housing about 20-some animals, and um, we were happy to report all our animals were safe, our staff was safe, so that was the good part of it. The unfortunate part is that that area, because of different hurricane standards, is not insured, so it's up to us and the community to help us out to be able to rebuild and move forward. But, but what happened to the animals? I mean, it was raining, it was a fright, the weather was frightening, it, and, and it dogs was. tend to get frightened in bad weather. They certainly do. And, and all of a sudden, the roof comes down on them. Yeah, well, everyone worked together to get the animals in different crevices of our shelter. We kind of had a makeshift shelter for about a day until we could figure out where we needed to go from here. Now, I understand Pinellas County Animal Services came to your aid. They did. They were one of the first people to reach out to us. Um, several people from Animal Services called us right away and said, what can we do to help? And during that time, we had about 34 animals that were coming to the shelter. And instead, they offered to board those animals and care for them for a few days until we could figure out what we needed to do and get them back into our facility. So I can't tell you how grateful we were because, honestly, we didn't know what we were going to do. We were to the point where, what do we do with these animals? Um, are we going to have to put them in people's offices? Are, pe are we going out for pleas for foster? So they really saved us that day. I mean, they saved us for several days in, in caring for these animals. So we are just so grateful. Now, I understand that all the animals are back where they belong now. They are. They are. They're back at our facility waiting for their forever home. Um, we're slowly getting them processed and back into our adoption floor, and um, it's a little challenging because we can't use all the kennel area that we would like to right now, but yeah, they are back in our facility. Yeah, you were telling me that earlier that you still have some repairs that need to be made. Yeah, we have a gaping hole in one of our one of our adoption. That needs panels. to be fixed. It does need to be fixed, but we're thinking, you know, maybe this is a blessing in disguise. Um, the facility has been around. We've been serving the community for over sixty four years, and some of the facility is a little old. So maybe it's time to look at and maybe start to rebuild. Now, when the animals came back from animal services. They're all in pretty good shape. They're all. Uh... They were all well cared for. They're in great shape. We, I mean, we had no concerns because we trust our partners and we know they're 
that they're going to do everything for our animals. So they came back there in great form. We got them up into our adoption facility, and now they're just waiting for their homes. So uh, have any of them been adopted uh, yet? Uh, oh, yeah. We've oh, been, oh, okay. <laughs> we're, we're in a mad adoption process right now, and we're, we're getting as many out as possible. But, you know, as we're filling them through and filtering through, we're, we're going to keep adopting them out and... And going from there. So nine ninety nine, nine ninety eight, nine ninety seven. You'll reach your goal for sure. <laughs> We're going to reach our goal. I'm determined for it. Now, actually, you told me uh, before we uh, sat down to do the radio show that something historic was happening today at the Humane Society of Pinellas County, and that you had a very, very special adoption going going on. We 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 are one of the only facilities because we are a managed admissions facility. We are able to kind of. Um, decide which animals can be there and so our animals can stay until they are adopted we'll keep them there up to three years we've had animals I mean there's no time limit for our adoptable animals of course the shelter situation isn't the very best for for any animal we but we do the very best and provide them enrichment but coral um, a six-year-old Rottweiler who's been at our facility for I'd say a good eight months now um, is being adopted right right as we speak so <laughs> we are really excited everyone's excited she has some medical challenges and we've done some water therapy with her to try to get her as adoptable as possible but you know kudos to the people that are adopting her because she's an awesome dog she just had to find the right home and I know that everybody thinks the puppies are so cute and they are yes who, they who are can resist <laughs> but the older dogs need love and attention as well and they give lots of love and attention they certainly do and you know you know what you're getting when you adopt an older animal you know you find out if it comes in via owner surrender you find out about you know what their temperaments like and we do behavior evaluations at our shelter as well but we can evaluate we can tell if an animal's house trained so we can give them a lot more information and those wonderful things that most people want when they're adopting that you're not going to get when you're adopting a puppy now if uh, people want to help if they want to help with your repairs because mm -hmm. as as you said that, that ga gaping hole is still there <laughs> yes. and you're gonna have to do something with that yes if they want to help uh, kind of get you back on your own two feet get things back to normal what can they do well we're always of course looking for volunteers we have an awesome volunteer manager and we are always looking to build a more robust volunteer program certainly we are a nonprofit organization so we are looking for donations in kind such as cleaning supplies bedding anything like that if people have and they'd like to um, give that to the shelter that would be awesome as well as monetary donations so we can keep moving forward and get that gaping hole fixed. Now, adoptions, as you mentioned, are up and running once again. Yes, they are. So are you open? When are you open for people to come browse the selection? We are open every day except for Wednesday. So um, during the week, we're open 1130 to 530 and on the weekends from 10 to 4. And how many dogs uh, do you have, dogs and cats, for people to choose from? I'd say right now, I mean, we have a, quite a selection. We probably have on our adoption floor, I'm not waiting for spay or neuter surgeries at that point because we do spay and neuter all of our animals before they come onto the adoption floor. Um, but we probably have about 60 plus animals, uh, dogs waiting for a home, as well as a couple hundred cats and kittens. Couple of hundred cats yes, and kittens. Yes. So the dogs uh, get adopted quicker than the cats and kittens. Well, we just have the ability to house a little more cats than we are with the dogs. The dogs get separate kennels, and the cats we have a lot of communal living for our cats because they they enjoy that. So um, we're able to house a little bit more. Now, what sorts of animals are people looking for? You know what? What we're trying to do is provide the best matches. So somebody will tell us, well, this is my lifestyle. This is kind of what I think I'm looking for. And they might walk out with something different because our goal is to make sure we're providing the best match possible as opposed to, you know, everyone comes in and they see the cute puppies and they're like, I want that, I want that. And then they realize, wow, that's a lot of work and maybe that's not the right fit for my household right now. So our goal is to really get to know the adopters and find out what their needs are so we can provide the best match possible. And that's great. Some people are looking for Indoor dogs. Some yep. people have big backyards. Sure. Some people have kids and families, yeah. and uh, and it's impossible, I think, j just by meeting a dog to understand the disposition, the personality. But you guys already know that. We're doing our best to <laughs> having cared uh, for that animal for for so long. Sure. So, so it's great that you provide that service. Where do you get your dogs? The bulk of our animals come from Pinellas Animal Services. Is that right? Yes, well, certainly. Right. I mean, they are our first and foremost biggest priority for us. We want to make sure that we're serving Pinellas County. Um, sometimes we do get animals from outside. Pinellas County if there are high volume shelters there's a lot of high volume shelters in the south that uh, tend to euthanize excessive amounts and they've asked us to if we have the room to be able to take some of their animals so we do that on occasion as well
Well, I know we have a lot of great dogs and cats and animal services. I've seen many right. of them. <laughs> and, of course, we have our own adoption program also. But it's great that you can help us out uh, because that is what we're in business for, to try to find new homes for That's these right. very lovable and loving creatures uh, that through no fault of their own are orphaned or, or find themselves homeless. So it's very important that we work together as a, as a team, as partners, Absolutely. to find these animals uh, new homes. And it's a great day. When, when somebody takes a new dog or cat home, I, it's great. It's a win-win-win situation for everybody. Absolutely. I mean, Animals provide such love. I mean, it's part of your family. Who wouldn't want a new fluffy member of their family? Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Sarah Brown. I'd like to thank my guest on this part of the program, Sarah Brown, Executive Director for the Humane Society of Pinellas. And we would encourage our listeners, if you have any comments or questions on anything we've talked about on this program, send us an email. That address is animals at pinellascounty.org. And we'll share your concerns on future editions of For the Love of Animals. Well, the heat is on this summer, and animals feel it, too. Coming up after the break, Dr. Caroline Thomas from Pinellas County Animal Services tells us how to keep our pets cool when it's hot outside. Stay with us. And we're back. Welcome back to For the Love of Animals, a presentation of Pinellas County Animal Services and Inspiration 1110 AM. I'm Len Sazinski with the Pinellas County Communications Department. Well, we saw the headline in the paper just the other day, Summer Heat Settling into the Tampa Bay Region. And by golly, it's hot outside as we crank up the air conditioning in our homes and cars and workplaces. As we do all that, we have to give a lot of consideration to the comfort of our pets. And with me today to share some advice on the subject is Dr. Caroline Thomas, Director of Veterinary Services for Pinellas County Animal Services. Welcome, Caroline, to the program. Hi, Lynn. Thanks for having me. Actually, before we get started uh, on the last segment that we just did with Sarah Brown from the Humane Society of Pinellas, we failed to give the contact information uh, for that organization, so I want to make sure people know where they are if they want to uh, avail themselves of some of the services. They are the Humane Society of Pinellas. They are located at 3040 State Road 5. 90 in Clearwater, and that's just west of McMullen Booth Road up there. Uh, you can give them a call at 797-7722. Once again, that's 797-7722. Well, it's hot out there, Caroline. It sure is, Len. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's 92 degrees in the shade, uh, and it's going to get hotter, mm -hmm. as unbelievable as that is. Our dogs and cats, they're in the same environment we are. They don't complain, but they must get hot. Do they feel the heat more or less than humans, or what, what's their reaction to the heat? They feel the heat very similar to who we do, Len. And what we find is just like with people, um, different dogs and cats are more acclimated to the heat than others. So dogs and cats that spend a majority of their time outdoors are much more suited to handle the hot weather than pets that spend most of their time in air conditioning um, that go outside. They have a lot harder time coping with that. We see the same thing with people. There's those of us that are really acclimated and can spend all day outside in this kind of weather. And there's those of us that spend most of our time indoors and have a really hard time outside. Now, that's a good point. Does it vary by breed? I would imagine a dog like, say, an Alaskan Husky, uh, who is perhaps bred to withstand cold weather, might be more susceptible to hot weather. Oh, definitely. We find that our thick-coated breeds, so with those very thick hair coats, definitely have more insulation from their hair, which can keep that heat in. So they're more susceptible to problems with the heat. Do animals tend to have a heavier coat in the wintertime? Do they shed a little bit in the summertime? Uh, typically, they'll shed in the springtime as the seasons change, and they'll shed out a lot of that really heavy undercoat. Um, so that they have a lighter coat for the summer weather. But in those really heavy breeds, it's still not enough to really tolerate the heat very well. Now, dogs and cats both, they have lots of uh, fur. You know, we mentioned that. Now, how easily can they get overheated? They can overheat very quickly. And the places that we see that a lot is if they're left outside in the sun without shade and access to water. Um, also, if they're ever left in a car, and I want to just make sure that people know this is, this is a place in the world where you can never leave your pet in the car. Those cars heat up so quickly, it gets like like an oven in there and unfortunately that can be fatal if it gets too hot all right let's go over that because I did make a point the environments to avoid it says here on my notes and you mentioned the car okay mm -hmm. uh, for, for just a few seconds if, I, if I'm just running into the grocery store to get something for dinner can I leave the dog with the windows cracked just for a second should never leave them in the car especially in the summer um, and one of the things we find too is sometimes people will walk by they don't know how long the, car, the dog or cat has been in the car um, and sometimes they'll call out police and can break your window to make sure that animal's safe so 
it's never okay to leave your pet in the so car. So don't do it at all. What about air conditioning? If I leave the car running with the air conditioner on, is that okay? That would be okay for your pet, but again, a very, very short amount of time because right. we don't want to leave them unattended in there. So just for a couple of seconds, sometimes time can get away from you and mm-hmm. you're in the store longer than you think. Absolutely. Uh, and you want to make sure that that dog does not suffer. You mentioned the backyard. A lot of people do leave their dogs and cats in the, in the backyard all day mm-hmm. long sometimes when they're at work, uh, but you're telling me that even in a shaded backyard, it can be too hot for a dog's comfort. It can, and we just have to make sure that the dog or the cat is acclimated to that heat so it's not like they've just been inside all year and then they're thrown out in the middle of June or July, um, that they've had some time outside, but that they do have access to shade, ideally a shade structure like a dog house that they can get in, and they absolutely need fresh water available at all times. So if they're an outside dog, mm-hmm. uh, they can acclimate themselves more to the heat than, than perhaps somebody that's been inside, mm-hmm. uh, used to air conditioning. Oh, yes. So that's a, that's a factor to take into consideration. I um, want to remind everybody that I'm talking with Dr. Caroline Thomas, Director of Veterinary Services from Pinellas County Animal Services, and we are talking about dogs and cats and heat. Not in heat, but in the, in the heat of the summertime. What are some of the symptoms of overheating now? How can I tell if my dog or cat has had too much heat? Well, one thing that we see is dogs and cats don't sweat like we do. So their main way of letting out that excess heat is to pant. So panting excessively or really breathing hard can be one of the first signs that we see. Um, what can happen if they get even more hot and it gets more severe is they can start acting weak. Their gums can either be pale or bright red. Um, and then we can get to situations where they'll actually collapse. And if we start seeing any of those, that's a medical emergency. We need to address that right away. Because I know dogs tend to pant a lot. Uh, you know, the tongue hangs out. Uh, it just seems when they're sleeping, they do that. Uh, so, so is there a difference between a dog panting normally and a dog panting because they're overheated? Yeah, what we see is when they're overheated, they're going to be panting a lot harder and a lot with a lot more effort than a normal you know pant that you might see when they're just a little bit excited or when they're sleeping so you told me that uh, a medical emergency requires a trip to the vet uh, how can we identify that as being a true emergency well definitely if we're seeing that heavy breathing and especially if we're seeing any weakness or lethargy or falling over they need to go to the vet right away if they just seem to be breathing a little bit heavy the best thing to do is get that pet and bring it into a cool area ideally air conditioning and give them a couple minutes to acclimate and if that's something that's going to resolve it home, that should resolve pretty quickly. Um, And if if we're not seeing improvement or that pet still looks like they're really having a lot of discomfort or difficulty breathing, they should go to the vet. Now, I know on a real hot day, I enjoy a glass of cold iced tea with lots of ice Mm -hmm. in it. Is it uh, a good idea to give a pet ice water? Oh, yes. Giving them ice water is a great way to cool them from the inside. But one mistake sometimes people will make is when a pet's overheated, they'll put them either in really cold water or spray them down with really cold water. And that's something we don't want to put on their skin. We want to use lukewarm or tepid water. That really cold water will cause all their blood vessels to constrict, thereby keeping all that heat inside. And we want to make sure that they're able to release that heat. So ice cold water is great for drinking, but don't ever put that on your pet. If your pet's overheated, you can get them wet, but use a tepid, lukewarm water and make sure that there's ventilation, a fan to help dry that off and pull off all of that moisture, just like what we do when we perspire to help cool us down. If my dog's outside in the yard, it's a hot day, playing in the hose, is that a good way to keep him um, a little bit more comfortable? Definitely. That can definitely help. And just taking frequent breaks, just like we would with ourselves, you know, taking frequent breaks so that we're not in a situation where we're seeing those signs of overheating. What about exercise? You know, we're going to talk about exercise with animals a little uh, later on in another uh, version of the broadcast here, but exercising on a hot day, should you do it at all, or is it okay to do a little bit of it, or what, what are the parameters there? I really recommend, just like with people, especially in the heat of the day, in the summer in Florida. That's a really, really extreme time of day. And even, you know, endurance athletes and endurance animals that are trained for that have a really hard time with those extreme temperatures. So if you're going to exercise with your pet, ideally early in the morning or in the evening when the temperatures are a little bit cooler, staying in the shade, making sure you take plenty of breaks for hydration, those are all ways that you can make it safe. And of course, making sure that everybody's conditioned and prepared to exercise. And once again, keep your eye on your pet. If uh, he looks like he's suffering, if he looks like he's uncomfortable he's not going to tell you but you mentioned panting so Mm -hmm. you have to keep your eye on how uh, labor uh, labor intensive the panting is and that'll give you a good clue as to how uncomfortable the dog is Mm -hmm. what about sun exposure now they're pretty well covered up dogs and cats are Mm -hmm. uh, but do they get sunburn 
They can, and especially on the areas where they don't have a lot of fur, so on the nose and on the tips of the ears. And we do have some hairless breeds of dogs, like the Mexican hairless or Chinese crested, that absolutely can get sunburned. So we want to make sure that those animals either have a sunblock appropriate for animals applied or wearing clothing that protects them from the sun's rays or just have limited time out in the sun. Because just like in people, that sun exposure can lead to skin cancer. So uh, we have to keep our eye on them. And I know mornings and afternoons, evenings, I shouldn't say afternoons, that's the hot, the heat of the mm -hmm. day, but it, it's hot even in the evenings, even in the early mornings. Uh, mm -hmm. it, may, it may crest at 92, 93, 94 degrees, but when the sun goes down, it takes forever for that outside mm -hmm. air to cool down. So as the sun gets lower in the sky, don't let that fool you. It's still hot outside mm -hmm. and maybe too hot for your pet. Yep. Absolutely. So um, they can't tell us, bless their hearts, they can't tell us uh, no. how they feel. <laughs> we have to be able to uh, vicariously feel it for them. And uh, certainly we're, we're going to do everything we can to keep our, our, our pet comfortable. What about going out places? We mentioned don't leave them in the car, but is it okay mm -hmm. to travel in the car? Uh, if, they're, if they're in the back seat, are they going to get enough air back there? Obviously your car mm -hmm. is going to be air conditioned. Is that going to be okay with that them? That should be perfectly fine for them. We want to take them to a park. We want to take them to mm -hmm. one of our Pinellas County dog parks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that's okay. a wonderful thing to do with them. One thing I would mention, too, is just remember they're not wearing shoes. And so walking on asphalt, that especially that's had the sun Ooh, beating down point. on it, can be really painful and actually burn the pads of their feet. So especially if you're out walking, you know, when the sun's beating down on that asphalt, it's really hot. Try and walk on the grass or, you know, try and keep them off those black streets. I would imagine that's true at the beach, too. That sand mm -hmm. gets awfully hot. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So always keep that in mind. And they do make some dog booties you can use if you really want to be able to walk your dog on some of those hot surfaces services to add a little bit of protection. Think of your dog's comfort. Mm -hmm. All right, Caroline, thank you very much. Oh, you're I'd like to thank my guest on this segment of For the Love of Animals, Dr. Caroline Thomas, Director of Veterinary Services for Pinellas County Animal Services. Remember, if you have a question for Dr. Thomas, simply email it to us at animals at pinellascounty.org, and we'll give you an answer to your question on a future edition of For the Love of Animals. Well, coming up after the break, we'll find out how Pinellas County Animal Services help make pets display placed by Tropical Storm Andrea, feel at home in their new home. Stay with us. Well, welcome back to For the Love of Animals. I'm Len Zizinski from the Pinellas County Communications Department. Now, we mentioned at the beginning of today's program the fact that the Humane Society of Pinellas quickly had to find new quarters for 20 animals in their care when part of their kennel roof collapsed during Tropical Storm Andrea. Well, right now, here's the story of how the staff at Animal Services rallied to the cause to take care of these unexpected guests. My guest this time around is Rusty Walker, Kennel Area Program Manager for Pinellas County Animal Services. Rusty, welcome to the program. Thank you, Lynn. Nice to, nice to be here. And how are things at Animal Services these days? Going quite well. Things are... Things are uh... A lot of changes better now than they were a week ago oh absolutely and it's only been a week ago actually june 6th uh, the, a week from the time that we're taping this yeah, program from today but a week ago you guys were pretty busy because we were under a tropical storm warning due to tropical yes. storm andrea yeah absolutely we were uh, monitoring the situation extremely closely to ensure that you know if the storm did escalate to a hurricane or even close to a hurricane we would have to uh, harden our facility, which would entail a great deal of work as far as shuttering the building, ensuring we had all supplies for uh, staff and animals alike. Now, I know we, we talk to people a lot about hurricane preparation for their pets, and with all the pets that you have at Animal Services, you take it very, very seriously. Tropical storms you can handle, but hurricanes are a little bit more uh, menacing, and, uh, and, and you do a lot of preparation in addition to what you've just mentioned. Oh, absolutely. we got to ensure that we have on, on hand, at least at minimum, enough food to last the animals for at least three between three to five days. And that's including cats and dogs. We're talking litter. We're talking hundreds of pounds of food and litter for the animals. Also, we got to ensure that we have enough uh, food and water and things along those lines on hand for staff as well for a minimum of three days until we're able to uh, get off site and get to where we need to get our supplies. Now, I know Animal Services is a very sturdy building. Yes. And it's able to take a lot of punishment. Not so with the uh, Humane Society of Pinellas. They had some structural damage, and it caused quite True. a concern on, on their part, and I would imagine on your part as well. Yeah, absolutely. Our, our uh, facility has actually been upgraded recently. We had our, uh, our, our main lobby uh, building has been hardened, so they reinforced the roof and uh, all the columns around the building. But with that being said about the Humane Society, naturally one of our first thoughts was the Humane Society, knowing that they're not as sturdy as us. So... As soon as the storm passed, that was one of the, our first partners that we reached out to to ensure that they were okay. Well, well, how did you get the news? 
Well, actually, one of uh, a staff member, I'm not sure exactly how they heard it, but they heard it shortly thereafter. Uh, they, uh, they incurred the damage, and we, uh, Dr. Uh, Caroline, actually reached out immediately to them and uh, to, to offer any assistance we could provide to them. Now, 34 animals, you guys are, are pretty much filled to capacity at any given day, and you may get sure. one or two animals that come in during the course of the day, but here were 34 animals looking for new homes. How yeah. were you able to accommodate them? Well, my staff, a testament to my staff, they, uh, they ready uh, one of our, we have three kennels, and they readied one of the kennels. They uh, prepared them. Any cages that weren't clean, they cleaned and sanitized them. They had the food ready for them, the water ready for them, and... Uh, they went the extra mile, and they really buckled down, and I got it done for them. Now, you told me earlier that uh, you all used a special vehicle to transport those animals from Clearwater to Largo? Yeah, it was actually a, it was a Humane Society a trailer, and it, it was, it's able to accommodate a large number of animals, and it had, like we said, you know, 30-plus dogs on there, cats as well, and uh, it's, a, it's a fully self-contained vehicle. It's air-conditioned, so uh, the, the animals are able to ride in long distances at a, at a, at a high comfort level. And what were the conditions of the animals? I know dogs and cats tend to react adversely to bad weather anyway. Were they hyper? Were they uh, very excited? Or? Surprisingly, they, they, they were calm. You know, oh, and, really? and I think that you know that's a testament to the staff, the Humane Society. You know, they they were ca well cared for. So when they came over on the ride, of course they're naturally a little bit shooken up, but uh, they were all they looked great. They, they they came across you know good spirits and uh, and it, and of course we we took care of them too. We babied them when we when we took them in. We took our time with them, and sure they all had nice little little potty breaks and they got to take a walk to get a little exercise. So we took care of them. And how long now? By this time the weather had improved, so things were back to normal Absolutely. weather wise. Uh, how long did you all have the uh, animals? Uh, we, they actually all, the, the last couple animal, actually dogs, got picked up yesterday. So we had them from just about a week. So they were in pretty good spirits. Sarah told us earlier in the program yeah, yeah. when they went back to the Humane Society. That's a real testament to your guys caring yes, and, and, uh, and attention to detail. Uh, yeah, and with that being said, I mean, I'd, I'd like to uh, touch on with the volunteers. And particularly yes, one, please. Of, one of our lead volunteers, uh, Gene Sunita. He, uh, he uh, spearheaded a, a project where he uh, helped organize the teen volunteers that we currently have in the shelter during the summertime. And uh, he was able to get these volunteers to a point where they're able to walk the dogs. So they were able to exercise all the dogs. I, I, every single last dog that was there was exercised, it was walked, it was cared for, and it, it was loved. And I know volunteers are such a big part of the operations of animal services. Talk to me a little bit about that. What kinds of jobs do volunteers do for y'all? Wow, they do a lot. I mean, they, they definitely help out my staff. They help with sanitizing of the cages. They help with customer service. They'll do walkthroughs. They'll actually sign in. They'll impound animals from the general public and or, you know, an owner, if the owner's there to surrender an animal. Um, they, uh, they go through some, you know, extensive training. Right now there's a new program. It's called SAVE. And it's, uh, it's through our volunteer services program uh, coordinator who offers it, Kelly B. Craft and Jan Seabald. And uh, SAVE, it stands for Shelter, Adopt, Volunteer, and Educate. And what this program does, it, it, it's a basic animal welfare program, and it teaches the teens you know, basic animal welfare and uh, how to uh, exercise and handle the dogs. And I think that's a great opportunity for teens, especially in the summertime. They get so attached to animals. I can imagine when yeah. these animals do get adopted out, it must be a bad day for the volunteers. It's good and it's bad because they can see all their hard work and dedication and love that they put into this animal actually paid off. Now, adoptions are, are, are pretty much up, uh, statistically speaking, yes. these days. Uh, you guys are doing such a great job of finding new homes for these animals. Thank you. Um, how many, how many, can you tell me how many animals basically, like in the course of a week, you find new homes for? Uh, I can't give you an exact number, but I can kind of give you, give or take sure. a, at least, I mean, you got to keep in mind that we supply all the local Bay Area Pet Smarts and, okay. uh, and various uh, pet stores as well. So we supply them with each and every one of their cats they adopt out. Those cats come from our facility. So, I mean, that literally that number could be, you know, upwards of 60 to 100 cats a week, give or take. And that's including our, our facility as well, doing adoptions out on, on cats. And, of course, uh, Sarah, earlier in the program, told us that the Humane Society of Pinellas gets a lot of their animals from y'all. Yeah, w which is a huge asset to us. It's a benefit because the bottom line is we want to get out as many animals as we can. We want to save lives. We want to adopt. Now, we talked to her earlier in the program uh, about what kinds of dogs people are looking for, and I might ask you the same question. Do you find it to be the same way? Are people looking for puppies? They, do they want the young uh, dogs that are all eager and frisky, or do they prefer some of the older breeds? What I find is people, the, the, their first thing, the first inclination, they lean towards a small breed dog, because it's cute. You know, it's a chihuahua, a rat terrier, something, you know, a beagle, something small, something along those lines. And, but, uh, I mean, for us, the small dogs, they go extremely quickly. So, typically, when somebody shows up later in the afternoon, 
the, they're going to find you know the medium range to larger breed dogs. Typically, the small breeds go first. How quickly can can you find a new home for an animal that comes in? Well, after after the hold time, typically we hold an animal for four days, and once they're evaluated by our medical staff and they're determined that they meet our criteria, and that is they have to ch- you know their temperament has to check out. Uh, health of, of the animal medically they have to be you know sound but once they meet our criteria which is not real stringent once they meet that they are uh, they could be placed in a matter of a couple days afterwards that's great that's yeah, great so they can come in and we can get them out as quickly as humanly possible and, and I know you mentioned uh, checking the, the dogs and cats out medically I know you all do a great job of making sure that they're healthy that they're all spayed and neutered absolutely yeah they're checked for heartworms they're checked for. They, there's there's a slew of tests they run. The uh, medical tests they perform on them just to ensure that they're 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 healthy. We want to adopt out you know the highest quality dog that we possibly can. We want to stand behind these dogs and cats. And also there's you know the temperament test. There's a food aggression test. So it, it's pretty. Uh, it's a pretty thorough exa- thorough examination. And you also have a few tests for the owner as, as uh, well. I yeah, understand. yeah, absolutely. We just you know we're. we're we want to ensure that w- the animals that we're placing, that you know, they go to good homes. So you know, we're, we're looking into them, not too deeply, but we we check with the landlords. We ensure that yes, these people are allowed to have you know a cat or a dog at their residence, and you know, we want the best for both parties involved. Do you ever have a situation where somebody might bring a dog back? Maybe maybe it was a bad match, and somebody might bring a dog back looking for a replacement or a different kind it, of dog. It has happened, and typically in those situations, we try to educate and work with the individual, and you know, give them you know solutions, you mm-hmm. know, possible you know possible answers, possible things they can work with. And if that doesn't work out naturally, we're going to take the dog back, absolutely. But um, I, I, I know from talking with you all that so many times uh, your research in advance, your preparation in advance, makes for perfect matches. And I know a lot of these people will come back, like, for example, during the annual Animal Services Reunion, yes. they will come back with animals that they have adopted. Both absolutely. of them are very happy. Yes, absolutely. And it's quite an event to participate in because you see dozens and dozens and dozens of happy families. Yep. Uh, they all started out at Animal Services. Absolutely. And that's funny you say that because we actually had a meeting today. Today was our first meeting for our uh, upcoming, in December, our uh, what we call, it used to be called kind of an open house, and now it's called the Paws Cause. Okay, sure. But today was our first meeting, and we're kind of kind of hit, hit the ground running today. Got the wheels spinning, and we're... Uh, Starting doing our research, doing our homework, and getting our ducks in a row so we can uh, throw a bigger and better uh, pause cause than we ever have before. Now, summer is here, and you guys have a lot of summertime promotions uh, as well. Uh, we're in yeah. the middle of June here. we got July and August coming up. So what can people look forward to if they're looking for a deal on an adoptable animal? Absolutely, and it's funny you say that again because right now our adoptions are reduced. Typically, our adoptions for our cats and dogs are $40, and that includes the licensing, the spaying and neutering of the animal, and the rabies shot and all their vaccinations. Right now, that same animal is is $25. So it's a heck of a deal. That's great. And uh, there are a lot of dogs and cats out there. They're all looking for new homes. They're all so cute. I know I, I, I visit animal services frequently, and it's hard to come away empty-handed. Yes, it it's is. hard not to adopt everything, <laughs> everybody, everyone yes. that's, uh, that's up for adoption. Absolutely. Well, that's great. When can people come by? What's the best time for people to come by and, and take a look for themselves? Well, Monday through Friday, our hours are. We're open from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. We actually just, you know, in the past couple months, we uh, lengthened our hours. We used to be to 5 p.m., but now we, to encourage more adoptions and help you know, owners reunite with their lost pets, we, uh, we stretch our hours to 6 p.m. now. And we did the same thing on Saturday as well. We used to be 9 to 12, but now we're 9 to 1. So we're trying to, you know, accommodate the citizens in every way we can. And you are located where? We are at 12450 Almerton Road. And that is in Largo at 33774. And you can call us at 582-2600. All right, Rusty, thank you very much. Thank you very much to my guest this time around, Rusty Walker from Pinellas County Animal Services, who does such important work for the dogs and cats and pet owners throughout Pinellas County. Well, coming up after the break, we go to the mailbag. What should you do when your neighbor's dog barks too much? The answer when we come back. Well, we're back. Welcome back to For the Love of Animals, a presentation of Pinellas County Animal Services and Inspiration 1110 AM. I'm your host, Len Szynski, and joining me right now is John Hohenstern, Senior Animal Control Officer at Pinellas County Animal Services. John, hello. How are you? Welcome to the program. Uh, Good morning, Len. Thanks. Nice to be here. I wanted you to actually make a correction. I uh, referred to the, uh, the intake rate at Animal Services in our last segment. I thought maybe you got two or three dogs and cats a day, but you're going to tell me the number is greater than that. Yeah, we average like 100 animals a day between what comes in through the front door and what our guys manage to pick up on the road. Where do those animals come from? Well, I mean, some of them are owner surrender, some of them are strays that people find just running around and bring them in. 
That is amazing that, uh, that, that you guys, and I know there's a whole intake process, I would imagine. Oh, yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, every animal needs to be impounded. And, you know, if somebody finds a stray, we ask them where they found the stray animal at, you know, um, so we can try to return it to the, the owner. And, you know, every animal that's impounded is uh, checked for a, a microchip, you know, to, and hopefully it's in our system so we can reunite that animal with its owner as quickly as possible. So you guys, you animal control officers, you really stay busy. Yeah, they keep us very busy. All right. Well, John, uh, you know, this is the mailbag part of the program, and uh, we do get a lot of email into animal services. And I've got a couple of uh, emails that we've gotten in recently. It says here, neighbor's dog, uh, dogs bark night and day. This is a, a lady from St. Petersburg. Myself and my neighbor in my duplex have tried to get them to keep their many dogs quiet. Please, someone help us. Here's another email from Clearwater. Dog, dog barking day and night for a few days now. Did not see any activity at the home or any lights in the evening. Tried calling owner's phone and there's no answer. We were annoyed at first from all the barking, but now we're concerned for the dog. We that, that, that theme is in a lot of these letters. Mm -hmm. Can someone come out to check the situation? I'm concerned about a small dog. Lady from Clearwater again. Uh, he was outside barking all day on a certain date. I saw there was no food or water for it anywhere. We tried knocking on the door, but no one is home. Uh, the dog just barks too much. I guess that's probably the number one complaint I see coming into the mailbag from Animal Services is the neighbor's dog barks bark. too much. So let's start at the beginning of all this. Why do dogs bark? Well, yeah, why do dogs bark? Because uh, the, the squirrel's running over the, the power line overhead, you know, because the, the, the plane's going, you know, across the sky, you know, because it can hear the fire engine that's going by four blocks away. You know, I mean, dogs bark for various reasons. But uh, it, do, they, do they bark because they're afraid or they're curious or they're being defensive or? Uh, well, it, it could be all of the above. Mm -hmm. But usually a dog will only bark for a, a set time. Let, let's say a couple of minutes for whatever, for, you know, the mailman that walks by or the car that goes through the alley and then they'll stop. But in order for barking to be a real problem, it needs to be like prolonged, yeah. you know, and just continuous. And for what's seeming to be like no other reason than all they want is to get in the house or for somebody to come out of the house. And I guess they learn, you know, they're barking, 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 and something happens. And once they learn that lesson, they'll bark till something happens. It's kind right, of a till conditioned something, till something response. Happens again. Yeah. It'll, they'll, they'll wait till kingdom come before <laughs> they stop barking. Right. Uh, now, okay, so here's the situation. Just like these emailers, these letters that have come in, people can't take it any longer. I mean, this is a very dense, po populated county. Right, a lot of absolutely. dogs and cats out there. We're living in pretty close proximity to one another. And if a dog's barking in your backyard, he you might as well be in my backyard. I can't take it any longer. What do I do to complain? Yeah. Well, you can give us a call. You know, um, our phone number is 727-582-2600. And um, tell us what's going on. And uh, probably one of the first questions that you're going to be asked is, have you spoken to your neighbor? About well, I was this? going to ask you that. Is that should I do that first? You know, well, we encourage it because just like you said, if you're working the night shift mm -hmm. and you're not there and you don't know your dog's making this noise. I mean, it could be just that simple that they just don't know. And sometimes just, a you know, a friendly little, hey, neighbor, you know, or a little note saying that, you know, hey, your dog was barking all night last night and it really disturbed my family. You know, can you please do something about it? it you know, that could resolve the problem. Now, can I go on the website? Are there forms on the website that I can fill in and send to you all? Well, yes, but, you know, um, we don't like to elevate it to that level until, you know, we okay. make contact with the, uh, you know, the, the dog owner. Um, like it, if you call in and you, you know, you say, well, yes, I did. I did talk to my neighbor about it and nothing's changed. Um, we'll run the address in our system. And if we've never been out to that address before and we do show a German Shepherd dog that's current on its license and its rabies vaccination at the address, we will probably send them what we call a barking letter, which is just, you know, a letter saying, hey, we received a barking complaint uh, you, you know, against your dog. Um, we're not saying that the complaint is true. We're just letting you know that, you know, you live in one of the most densely populated counties in all of Florida, you know, and we received this complaint. And, you know, you might want to do something about it. And a lot of times that works. Yeah, it has. I've heard it, uh, it worked for you. Yes, it did, <laughs> as a matter of fact. Uh, we were talking about that earlier, that I had a dog. The gentleman worked nights, and uh, actually he was out of town. He went out of town uh, for a couple of nights, and the dog would bark, uh, but only when he was not home. So he was quite surprised right. that it was a problem at 3 o'clock in the morning. And he took steps to remedy the situation, so it worked out great. Right. So, um, like I said, we like to make contact with the dog owner before it gets to the, to the 
the point where neighbors are going to fill out verified statements. And um, so we like to, you know, make contact with them and say, look, you know, we've received another complaint. You know, um, you got the barking letter, you know, two months ago. Now, you know, we're being told that the barking hasn't stopped. And then we counsel them on what might happen if two neighbors get together and fill out a uh, verified barking statement. Do you do this by phone? Do you go pay no, no, them a no. visit? We'll, we'll, we'll send somebody out okay, to visit okay. them at this point because we need to educate them as, as much as we need to educate the, you know, the people that are bothered by the barking. Now, according to some of these emails, uh, some of these people have some rather surly neighbors. And yeah, sometimes so, talking doesn't do any good. Right. And, you know, and understandable. Um, but then, there, well, there is, you know, some recourse after the uh, initial contact. Uh, they've, well, they've got the letter. They've got the visit from the animal control officer telling them, look, if two of your neighbors are willing to fill out a verified barking statement, which is basically a schedule of a week mm -hmm. that at least two neighbors from two different residents will fill out and they keep. And if there is a time and date um, on both statement forms that get sent in that, you know, these neighbors were bothered by the dogs barking, um, we will issue a citation based on these verified statements from at least two neighbors. And I guess you have to have that. I think in some situations, I mean, dogs will bark. Right. I mean, even the best behaved dogs will bark. And, and I think sometimes neighbors are just so incredibly sensitive to that that they overreact. Do you find that to be true? Well, it could be. You know, there's, you know, there are dog people, there are cat people, there are some people that don't like any kind of animals. So, you know, and then, you know, it being in the most densely populated county in all of Florida, um, you know, people move around a lot. So, you know, the, the, the nice little old lady that used to live next door and be so quiet, now she's moved and somebody's moved in with a big dog. And they're from Texas. Yeah. And they're used to just leaving their dog outside, and so it barks. It's not a big thing when your you know, neighbor's half a mile away, but when your neighbor's just right there, it's, it's a problem. So we're back to the situation where we do have now. I, I went over to my neighbor's house, and she lives next door, so she's got a form. I've got a form. We've filled it out. And sure enough, there's that dog barking at 3 a.m., just like just constantly. So we have these forms. We give it to you all. And what happens after that? Well, we, we verify, you know, that on a specific time, you know, date and time, that at least two neighbors were bothered by the barking of the dog. You know, we verify it. We make sure that, well, it's a, it has to be a notarized statement where these people are, you know, say it's a, a you know, it is a true and accurate, uh, you know, statement of what happened. And uh, um, if we do issue the citation based on the statement forms, both of these neighbors are going to need to show up in court and tell okay. the judge, yes, so there is prepared for that. There, there is a problem here. So once everybody knows that, um, you know, we will, you know, issue a citation to the dog owner. But, you know, only after we've made contact with them, like I said, via a letter or via a visit. And I'm going to guess that that citation is pretty effective if it comes from the judge. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, if, um, well, if they, if the dog owner contests the citation, it's a, it's a $123 uh, citation. Mm -hmm. um, if they contest it and they want their day in court and everybody has to show up in court, um, the judge could impose a max fine and it could go up to $500 if wow. you know he thinks that there is a problem. Yeah. Lots at stake here. Um, I want to be a good dog owner. I want to be a good neighbor. How can I keep my dog from barking? How can I retrain my dog not to bark? You know, well, so sometimes it's just as, e it's just as easy as close the doggy door during the day, you know, um, you know uh, and, th and that's it. Sometimes these, you know, dogs have the ability to come and go and, you know, they'll get out and bark for a couple minutes, bother somebody and, you know, and, well, yeah, I've got a doggy door. And then you say, well, you know, we've got raccoons in the county. We've got alligators in the county. Sometimes maybe a doggy door isn't the best thing to have. But um, there are also on the market um, several barker collars that you can buy. Well, I was going to ask you, I've seen some of those on the Internet, these, these, uh, these devices that maybe you put it on a tree or something, and it's supposed to emit a high fr a pe a frequency pitched uh, sound that dogs don't like to hear. Yeah, well, no, I, well the, the ones that have been the, the most effective you know, that, that I have seen have been the collars that either emit a scent like a really strong orange scent that the dogs oh, don't okay. like or that do give them a, a little bit of a shock. But that doesn't really hurt the dog, does no, it? No, no. It just kind of gets their attention or whatever. It's, you know, like it's a behavioral response, you know, barking, you know, ooh, a little pain, you know, no barking. Yeah, yeah.
So keeping him inside uh, is, is, is pretty much the first line of defense. That's right. I mean, because if, if the dog's inside where it belongs, you know, and, and, you know, and especially in the summer when the windows are closed because mm-hmm. everybody's got their AC cranked on, that solves a lot of the problem right there. Well, we hope for a quieter neighborhood. And, John, we appreciate the, uh, the efforts that you all are doing to ensure that that is so. No problem. Len. Take care. Well, that brings us to the end of our program. I want to thank our guest this time around, John Hohenstern, a senior animal control officer with Pinellas County Animal Services. You have been listening to For the Love of Animals, presented by Pinellas County Animal Services and Inspiration 1110 AM. Be sure to be with us next Saturday, 11 AM to noon, right here on Inspiration 1110 AM for another episode of For the Love of Animals. And if you have any questions or comments on anything we've talked about on the program, just send us an email at animals at pinellascounty.org or give us a call at area code 727-582-2600. For more information on Pinellas County Animal Services, including photos of the dogs and cats up for adoption this week, go to our website, pinellascounty.org slash animal services, one word. Once again, thanks for listening. I'm Len Sazinski with the Pinellas County Communications Department. Join us next time for the love of animals.